Hi, and welcome back to the Impact One Million podcast, From Success to Significant. Today, our guest is the CEO and co-founder of Earbus, Paul Higginbotham. With over 30 years experience, Paul brings the leadership and business acumen that has seen Earbus go from a conversation around a kitchen table to a program helping thousands of children. Welcome, Paul. Hi, good morning, Sharon. Nice to meet you. Yes, you too. Look, I'd love to dive in and, and I guess, learn a little bit more about how this project came about. Uh, how did you end up doing this kind of work? Um, probably um, my, my mentor has been um, Professor Harvey Coates. Um, Harvey's an ENT surgeon and specialist who has really, for, for all his career, has worked in Aboriginal Australia. Um, it's a real passion of his. And he he saw the Airbus idea in New Zealand, um, where it was designed for, uh, you know, Maori and Polynesian families who don't engage with mainstream services. And he thought, oh, you know, that might work in Aboriginal Australia. So he, he actually tried to do it himself, but he's very good at fixing ears, but running buses is probably, you know, probably not really much of a bus driver. Um, and so he rang me up and said, you know, are you interested in this bus? And I kind of went, oh, yeah, okay, um, park it over there. But I, I actually knew next to nothing about Aboriginal Australia. You know, I, I mean, <laughs> it's shameful to uh, to think how little I knew in, in those days, uh, talking, you know, 15, 16 years ago. And um, I've lived in Japan for quite a long time. I knew much more about Japanese culture <laughs> than wow. I did about the first Australian nation, you know. So, mm -hmm. um, but once I got the bus, um, I, I knew there was a massive problem in um, Aboriginal kids' ears. And so I knew we, if we were going to do something, we we wanted to do it as well as it could be done. I, I wasn't interested in a, a tokenistic version or, a, you know, something that really didn't have an impact. Um, at the time, I was reading um, a couple of Jim Collins books, Built to Last, and um, from good to great, both of which came out of um, work done at Stanford in the States, you know, and it was about how to build a really great organization as opposed to just, you know, a good one. And yeah. and so so a lot of that thinking shaped what we did with Earbus. So for me, it was, um, it then became a personal journey uh, about, you know, gee, I'm surprised how much I don't know here and, so, you know, a lot of listening and learning, um, a lot of just paying respect to people whose culture has been here for 65,000 years and still we don't understand it, you know. <laughs> so um, yeah. so that, that's where I started. And I, I think it, in reality I went to a conference out in the gold fields in about uh, 2007 or something and I sat down amongst a group of people and realised how little I knew. Um, so steep learning curve. Um but intrinsically interesting. So, um, you know, it's not it's not been a chore to learn it. It's been a joy and a privilege, to be honest. So, mm, Absolutely. And I think there's so many points that we could all probably take from that because there isn't a lot of conversation around uh, the, you know, the Indigenous population. It's it's not something that people dive into and talk about. and uh, And so a lot of us don't know. And, uh, you know, there's so much more we probably could be doing to support. Well, interestingly, um, I, my time in Japan um, was not wasted in the space because Aboriginal society, like Japanese society, is a very collectivist um, society. You know, it's not about the individual. It's about all of us, the group. And so a lot of the um, things that I'd learned there, which were culturally um, different actually applied in this space too so it wasn't wasn't a big leap for me you know I, I kind of went oh yeah I, I, I know what this is like and yeah. you know um, Japan has two main religions Shinto and Buddhism and Shinto is very much an animistic religion so the belief that there's spirits in rocks and trees and okay. stuff you know and an Aboriginal um, religion is, is a bit similar you know so mm -hmm. the spirits of ancestors mm -hmm. return in the form of rocks and boulders and stuff so so you know I, I kind of had a little bit of um prep from my time there but um, mm. yeah I mean there's a an awful lot of work to do in Australia to mm. to raise awareness of 
how that culture functioned here for you know six and a half millennia, so or sixty-five yeah, millennia. So. It's incredible, incredible. And and so the work you're doing with earbuds. Uh, how did that, like that that moment of the bus churning up, it's like park it there, what do I do now? Was there a, a catalyst moment or a 2 a.m. moment, if you like, that made you realise that this is what you need to do and now I've got to go make it happen? Um, I, at the time, I was CEO of a early intervention centre in Perth, you know, and we did a, quite a lot of things. We had programs for kids with delayed speech and language, we had programs for deaf children you know we were doing screening in hospitals so the earbus was only one part of what we did and so i i probably only gave it 10 percent of my attention because it was you know one of 10 programs um and then i recruited um the head of uh, a new head of department um dr now dr lara sure and um lara and i became co-founders of earbus uh, later on but once Lara came in, she had the ability to actually translate what I wanted into action. So then I found, my, found myself um, working more and more with her on the project. And then I turned around one day and about 80% of my time um, in this quite diverse agency was going on this one project. And I went, okay, this is telling me something. And yeah. I remember um, <laughs> saying to Lara in 2011, you know, this is – this is really complex. This is culturally complex. It's operationally challenging. It's at you know remote locations. This needs a standalone charity. Um, you know, doing this as a bit of what the other stuff we do, I don't think does it justice. Um, and so, that, lo and behold, I could start of twenty thirteen. Alara and I, with another colleague, D, we just went for it. We went, yeah, let's do this. Let, let's. Um, <laughs> Let, let's actually, you know, realise the dream of a standalone yeah. charity that only does this and does it well. Um, yeah. And, yeah, there's no no one sort of um, epiphany moment. but Well, actually, in a way there was because I, I was on holiday in New Zealand and stepped away from the day-to-day -day stuff. And then I just had this moment of clarity where I went, it's the standalone charity. Yeah. That's what it is, you know. Yes. Um, yeah. So, um, did you find it was because you were away, Paul? Because we talk to a lot of entrepreneurs in in the work that we do in media and publishing, and uh, it, you know, where when we're in it, we're in the the busy, the day to day. Our calendar's telling us what's next, what's next, what's next. And so sometimes we don't get that moment to just kind of take a beat and pause and and think clearly. So, did you find it was because you were away? Like, would that be a lesson for an entrepreneur to take away? Is that sometimes you need to stop and then the clarity of thought it just became really obvious to you like that's what I need to do yeah it's the clarity brought about by calmness and distance calmness. yeah yeah and yeah. uh and and what happens is the context of your world shifts and so you see it within a slightly different context so I think um I, I often um get my best ideas when I'm driving in the car yes <laughs> yeah <laughs> Um, it's it's the movement, isn't it? Like I find that as well. Yeah. I go for a drive or go for a walk and we have these board meetings while we're walking or driving. It's the movement of stuff and I think, oh, I can think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I was on a plane, again, coming back from New Zealand and I put the headphones on and listened uh, to Lanterns by Birds of Tokyo. And as I was listening to it, I went, my God, this is us. This song is about oh. us, you know. And so we we actually went to the guys in the band and asked if we could do a version of that, um, oh. and it's on our website. So and it's oh. a great version. I've had people email me saying oh, I was in tears after I watched that oh. <laughs> that, that video, <clears throat> you know. And um, so yeah, that, that clarity that you you need that as a <clears throat> as a CEO or an entrepreneur, you you need sometimes just to see things from a different angle. Um, yeah, it's very much because we get caught so much in the business that we need to work yeah. on it and we can't do that unless we take a beat and, and pause. And and so, Paul, for those that don't really know what Earbus is, would you mind just running <laughs> through that a little bit as well, please? Yeah, the, the idea behind Earbus essentially is that New Zealand idea that if people um, don't engage with mainstream services for whatever reason, um, uh, usually it's in situations of poverty or, or deprivation, then you probably need to find another way to get the services to them. And 
if they're not engaging, there's a cultural barrier there, obviously. Um, so um, when we when we first started working in Aboriginal Australia, people told us three things. Nobody turns up for appointments. None of the services join up and you can't get the babies. Okay, so uh, my brief here is to create the best program I can. So you've got to address those three issues. If you can't address them, you really shouldn't be tackling it, you know. So the Airbus model was go to where the kids are. Don't go to a clinic and sit yeah. your shiny backside down and wait for people to come because they're not going to turn up, you know, for all kinds of reasons. Yeah. So, um, you know, as an example, we, we sent an audiologist on a, a country uh, trip for a provider and they sat in an office for three weeks and saw 16 kids. Okay. <laughs> so our record for hearing tests, I think, is 88 in a day. And he did, wow. weeks, you know. So, I mean, so if you go to where the kids go are, to them. Um, mm. so you go to the schools, you go to the daycares, yeah. you go to the playgroups. And yet, sure, not every kid is there every time. Sure. But if you keep going back regularly, you will see all the kids. So, um, it, it clearly works, and um, the kids can 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 run, but they can't hide, you know. So, <laughs> in reality, um, and, and and once the kids actually realise it's fun that we're kind of cool people and we're fun <laughs> coming on the bus is is it gets yeah. you out of class, yes. then <laughs> you start to get the engagement sort of happening. So that was good, and and in in terms of joining the services up. We take all the services with us, so you don't have to join them up. So we've got a doctor, we've got a nurse, we've got oh. an audiologist to do hearing tests, and in the early days we had a ear, nose and throat specialist with us on every trip. So, so you know, the kid comes in and they can have everything in the one space. And That's so brilliant. the great thing about that too was that as a team of people, we learned so much from each other by working in close proximity and at elbow with each other that, the the the, um, the clinical rigor became quite quite a quite a challenge to keep up with everybody learning so much you know uh, which mm -hmm. is good and then you you can't get the babies well it sounds counterintuitive to go to schools to find babies but actually what happens is um, working with Aboriginal people you have to build trust you, you mm -hmm. they they've got to trust that you're there yeah. for the right reasons that yeah. you know what you're doing that you're good yeah. at what you're doing the kids like you you've yeah. got their best interests at heart and they're yeah. not a project you know um, yes yeah so if you can get the five-year-old well then mum is very likely to say hey uh, my three-year-old's got runny ears as well would you oh. can have a look at you know and, and it's not perfect by any means, but in my experience, it's better than anything else out there in terms of yeah. uh, reaching down to community. So, you know, in, in some of the regions we go to, we're, we're right on demographic for the zero to four kids, you know, like we're seeing um, the, the, the same number in that category as we are with the older kids. So, um, yeah, so so the, the idea that we could take it to where the kids are, that we would yeah. go regularly, we'd have all the services, including things like medications and stuff, and, and we would stay as local as possible. So kids needed surgery, we, we'd stay as local as we could and uh, and then just persist, you know, persist. And, and, Brilliant. Yeah. That's so amazing. And, you know, we talk a lot about on this show about, you know, you reach a certain level in life or business where you've reached what, whatever your term is for success, your definition, and uh, you're going from success to significance. And it's all about creating that impact and leaving a legacy. Uh, can you take us through a couple of moments that you've done something or just moments that have stopped you in your tracks and you've just stood there and gone, look at what we just achieved? <laughs> is there a moment that comes to mind? I'm sure there's many, but what's one you could share with us? <laughs> yeah, the, 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 there are literally so many. Um, and um, Lara, who's my colleague, uh, audiologist by profession, she's she's tiny. I, in fact, this morning I called her a stick insect. And... Uh, <laughs> And, um, that would have gone down well. No, no, it didn't go down well. Um, but, um, you know, I said to her, you're, you're going to be like the 65-year-old little lady walking down um, Barrack Street in Perth and this massive Aboriginal man is going to come up to you and he's going to, and you're going to think, you know, the worst <laughs> thoughts and he's going to go, I remember you, you oh, yeah. 
you know. And, <laughs> um, there's a couple. One that I, I often cite is a, an eight-year-old boy in Kalgoorlie who his, um, his granddad is a health worker and he desperately needed um, the, the rubbish in his ears clearing with grommets, you know. So you put tubes into the eardrum and it, it drains and aerates the ear. Um, anyway, his, his granddad kind of resisted for about nine months and our surgeon kept talking to him and saying, look, you know, we think this is the best thing, but so your call. Um, it's available if you need it. So, so anyway, we, we get to November and um, granddad says, yeah, look, let's do this, but can we wait until February? because he'll be swimming in the creeks, you know, his ears will get uh-huh. infected and stuff. So so we in February, we actually do the surgery. And uh, the next day we're at his school and Lara grabs him and rushes off to test his hearing, which is normal now for the first time since we've known him. Um, uh-huh. And um, and then by the end of that week, the school is calling up saying, what have you done to this child? Uh-huh. Like he's got friends, he's putting his hand uh-huh. up. Like a completely transformed human being. Oh. So we decided to capture the story uh, for the media, you know, um, just do a local news story. And we went out to Cal and we got a big group photo and the granddad was there, obviously. And he, he came over to me and he said, hey, um, he said, I just wanted to apologise for taking so long. He said, I had no idea, you know. And I said oh. to him, you're, you're a granddad, you're not a you're not his clinician. That's you're right. And you're just you're trying protecting to him. thing you can. Don't yeah. don't beat yourself up with no. guilt, you know. Um oh. said you, we got there in the end and now we've got something to work with, you know. Um oh. but just Happy the time. you know, having having an Aboriginal granddad apologize oh. to me was <laughs> just one of those moments you go, oh. no, 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 I mean, <laughs> oh, you know, that's not you know, and oh. um that's and definitely then, a Kleenex moment. Oh my goodness! <laughs> yeah, and, and I suppose the other one, which is particularly um, close to my heart, is um, community in the Pilbara. Where, oh my word, this is this is kind of third world stuff. You know, there's no hot running water. They're not on the electricity grid. Community lives on a basketball court uh, in their cars. You know, covered basketball court. It, it's really, it's it's third world stuff, and. Um, Anyway, when we first started going there, um, there was a, a little girl, she was nine years old, and for some reason she took a shine to me. So I'd be there working on the computer, typing the data in, and she'd come and lean on my shoulder, you know. Anyway, on about the third trip, she, she says to me, um, do you write books? And we were actually in the school library, or what passes for the school library. Um, and I said, oh, Why? And she pulled a book off the shelf and it was Paul Jennings, children's author. And there was a photo of him on the back and he had a beard. And I guess oh. all, all white fellas look the same, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so the I same think, first name. <laughs> same first name. And I said, yeah, yeah. I said, I wrote all those books, you know. Um, <laughs> and, of course, then when she found out I was bullshitting her, um, <laughs> she she loved it even more, you know. Oh, I love it. A joke with her and stuff. Anyway... <laughs> um, uh later that year her birthday is in november um two weeks before her birthday her her mum died in um headland health campus from renal failure and her auntie died the same week uh, so now this almost 10 year old girl is <laughs> lost her mum and her auntie you know and um so in the December trip, um, I had to go into Headland uh, for a meeting and I saw her. She was in a car park and she was with, I'm guessing, her dad and her uncle. Um, and she starts waving at me like a like a, a crazy person. And I'm waving back at her. I thought, I wonder what the dad thinks, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and um, um, and we just we just had this bond. I don't know. It was oh. anyway. Um, so fast forward to last year. And we're down, we're down in Esperance on the south coast, mm-hmm. thousands of kilometers away. And Lara texts me and she goes, This girl, let's call her Michelle, is is here at this, oh. this boarding school. And I went, You're kidding me. And so we went in, and she's now a 17-year-old oh. um, doing a trade certificate thing, oh. you know. Um, and it was just the most emotional moment to oh. recap. Um, and 
you know, she told us a story and we talked about some of her friends and kids and, you know, and and I, I often say, I, I, I don't know what the word is for these. They're not our friends. You know, that's a, an overstatement, but they're certainly not our clients. There's some no. kind of bond there with the kids and the families that you just, when you feel it, it just keeps you, keeps you motivated, you know, and um, mm. it's a, yeah, it, it, it's a, it's honestly a privilege <laughs> to do what we do. It's like, it's a privilege. It's, you know. That's amazing, Paul. It's just, it's so heartwarming. And I think sometimes we can often get caught up in, in the doing and we forget to be human beings. We're not human doings, we're human beings. You're doing the work and you're doing great work. But it's that those moments, I think, that bring us back to why we actually do what we do yeah. and the meaning of the work that you do and how that impacts and the ripple effect. And, you know, the, that girl, who knows what she could come uh, become in the future because of that interaction you've had. And, you know, that joke you made with her made her possibly realize that life doesn't have to be all that serious it's sometimes those little things that people don't often realize how much they make an impact in the world uh, by stepping into what they're born to do like this is your purpose it's it's amazing and so Paul what's next for Earbuff what's next for you and the journey that you're on now um well you know clearly I, I mean I'm closer to the end of my career than I am to even the start of Earbuff um and, I, you know, I always remember um, Ian Chappell saying that he wanted to retire at a moment when everyone said, why is he retiring? Rather than go at a moment where everyone says, why doesn't he retire? Doesn't he retire? <laughs> What's you know? he still doing here? <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I've got to kind of pick my exit moment at some point. Um, and I, I, I've... I've kind of struggled with it a bit over the last couple of years. And, uh, and I, I then had a little a moment where I went, okay, there's only two reasons that you'd retire. Either you don't want to do it anymore mm. or you can't do it anymore. Yeah. Well, I'm in the fortunate position that I can do it. I'm, I'm well, I'm healthy. I, I can still outrun most of our younger um, <laughs> clinic members on trip, you know. Um, and um, I, and I, I still have a passion for do. what we do. Um, you don't want to lose your edge and then put the agency at risk. Um, yes. So at some point or other, you know, we'll, we'll do a transition. So, um, but for me personally, I will stay connected. I, I'll probably do project work. I'll probably be at Elbow for the next CEO or whatever, um, you know, and um, we, the three of us who founded it, um, you know, we're still like the, the fire still burns. It, it's not, it's not a transient thing. It's not a fad, you know. It's, social justice is in the fibres of your being. It, it's, mm. you know, it offends you yes. um, when you see um, kids who have no opportunity, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. and kids whose natural potential. I mean, look, we've seen the footy players and the singers and the actors. Can we now please see the yeah. commissioners of police or the lawyers or the business owners yeah. or, you know, um, it, 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 it we've wasted generations of potential in Aboriginal Definitely. Australia, and it, it really is overdue that we yeah we're more inclusive as a society. You know, absolutely, absolutely, and children are our future. And uh, you know, my husband and I are ambassadors for Destiny Rescue uh, because personally linking it with my story. And uh, I was nearly a child bride at sixteen. I'm Indian, and uh, and you know, so it's this whole. Uh, giving girls a chance to have their futures rescued because they don't choose to go into sex slavery. And so for me, uh, having a media brand and, you know, books and magazines and TV shows that allows me to get that message out there uh, so that we can raise more awareness and, of course, raise much needed funds. And I think everyone, sometimes people look at big global issues and say, oh, that's just too hard. I can't, I can't make a dent. And I guess that's a big part of why we've put this whole Impact One Million project together is that I can't impact 1 million people, even with my brands and, and my network, but together we can. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're working on a beautiful project uh, that we're launching in New York in May 2024, and it's a hardcover coffee table book. We've been signed by a US publisher. It'll be globally available uh, in bookstores. And we're going to bring 100 people together from all over the world. But if each one of those 100 people, we select them, right, they go and impact 10,000 people in their network, we've hit a million. 
And so all of a sudden, a million goal doesn't seem like, and then it's like, well, what's next? Can we hit 10? Can we hit, you know, a billion? It's possible. It all starts with someone taking an action, which you've done. Uh, and I truly believe that, as you say, it's it's it, it's an injustice when we don't do something and you can't unsee something. You can't yeah, unhear really something, not. right? Yeah. And, and, and look, you know, I was talking to a group last night and saying, when when white Australians look at the complexity of the challenges in Aboriginal Australia, you know, like, okay, Alice Springs, it's all over the newspaper. You're not going to fix Alice Springs by getting rid of the grog. No. The problem's much more complex and multifactorial and multilayered than that. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, it, not saying that's a bad action to take. No. I mean, it's got community support, but if that's a reaction, that's the totality of your response. You, it's it's unfathomable. Yeah. You know. And, and so when you look at the complexity of the challenges across Aboriginal Australia, most most Australians, I think, go, oh, my God, what do we do? You know, <laughs> like, mm -hmm. oh, money's not the answer because we've spent all this money. Nothing yeah, seems yeah. to change. Where do we start? You know, how do we, you know, like, and, and I think there's a general sense in the mainstream community of, of frustration. Uh, there's a willingness to want to do something, but there's also a reluctance to just throw money at solutions mm -hmm. that don't work. And Aboriginal Australia is littered with um, failed programs, wasted yeah. money and broken promises. And so in, in reality, this is a really good place to start because ear disease is a disease of poverty. So wherever you find these, you know, diminished living conditions, um, you're going to see kids at risk of getting ear disease. Um, it's a highly communicable bacteria, or there's viral versions, but essentially there's bacteria that infect every kid. So we go to a community and every kid's got ear disease. And I can tell you now, Alice Springs, I was watching a footy game two years ago on the TV and they were showing crowd shots and every single kid in that crowd had, had runny noses. So, so what happens is the kids get it very early. They get it from two weeks of age, and on average, they have it for half of their first five years of life, right? So, so these kids have basically got a hearing loss for, for half of their childhood. <laughs> so, so it impacts yeah. everything. It impacts yeah. speech, language, yeah. play. Yeah. Confidence. You know, everything, everything. So by the time they start to fail, mm. they're set up to fail. And then the pathway is pretty clear. You know, they get to sort of year three and literacy becomes impossible. Yeah. When you have then they get frustrated and then they get angry and then they start to rebel and, and act out. And they and start then... to disengage. Yeah. And so yeah. really the challenge is to keep these kids in school. Mm. Um, you can't learn if you can't hear um, in this, this context. Yes. So, so keep them in school. Let's get a generation of these kids through school and then we'll see what we've got to work yes. with. Yes. Yeah, oh, it'll be amazing to see who these kids become when they've got the opportunity that, you know, all of us seem to take for granted. Um, mm -hmm. Something so you think so basic is hearing. You know, yeah. it allows us to do so much with our lives and these kids don't even have that. So therefore, how can they go on and become something amazing? And it will be really interesting to see in 50 years, you know, the results of the work you're doing now, where these people are, what they're doing, what they're doing with their lives because you've given them that, what should be a, a gift to everyone, but you've given it back to them. It'll be sensational. Interesting piece of work done in the Pilbara um, last year that I was kind of given a window into where Research Institute went in there and started asking communities, you know, what works, what doesn't work, what services do you have, what did you don't you have that you'd like, what do you value? And the, the feedback I got given was everywhere we went, people talked about earbuds. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that actually made me a bit teary at the time because we put a lot of work into that reach yeah, um, in building relationships and honourable relationships, okay. you know. Okay. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, I went, yeah, okay, you know, Aboriginal people have pretty good bulldust detectors. They, they know who's there for the right reasons. That, oh, absolutely. And so, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, we when one of those communities when we first went in, um, one of the elders, a woman, came in. She had a beanie and a big stick, and she plumped herself down on a chair. And she stayed there for six months. Never spoke to us. Never said a word. Just sat there. And um, and then after about six months, Lara um, was looking for one of the kids, and she went, "Okay, who's next?" And this lady, the elder, went, "This one." And we all just stopped in our tracks. We went, 
My God, she speaks. She speaks. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know what she's been doing, Sha? She's been watching us. Watching us. You're going, see okay, if you were the real deal. I don't know what they're doing. Do the kids like them? Do we want them in our community? Are they doing good work, you know? And and she basically was putting her imprimatur on us being in that community and working with those kids. And fair enough too, you know? Um, they're her people. Yeah, wow. Yeah. Imagine if we did that more in the Western society where we'd be, <laughs> you know, yeah. the elders and the young listening to them. And that's amazing. Paul, look, how can everyone listening today, one, how can they help you and how can they reach you? Um, well, you know, we, we're on the usual um, social channels. So we're on uh, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and stuff. And uh, our website's real easy to find. Just type in earbus.org.au. Uh, um, and the, the website's really good. It's uh, It's got a lot of um, info on there about where we go and what we do and how we do it and stuff. And there's lots of, um, you know, there's videos and photos on there of kids. Kids are just beautiful. You know, they're, they're some of the brightest, most beautiful kids you'd ever come across. And turns out that they are the best linguists in the country because 82% of them speak more than one language. <laughs> yeah, so <that's> right. um, <laughs> um, despite all the challenges. Um, so, um, and, you know, I'm a great believer in chaos theory. I, like, I network relentlessly because you don't know where the next helping hand's coming from, you know, and and so um, there's, there's stuff on the website that people can have a look at, and you know, we 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 kind of run about forty percent of our income is government related, twenty five percent is corporate sponsorships, um, about fifteen percent is self generated. We've got a clinic here, and we do contract work and stuff like that. And the rest is really put together from writing grants and getting donations. Yeah. So, um, you know, the people listening who can help in that space, that, that's great too, you know. And uh, so all of, really all of our money goes to kids and communities. We, you know, we our offices are in a converted duplex in East Perth, not the glamorous part of the city, mm. um, you know. And we, we, we share accommodation when we go on trips. We cook our own meals. Yeah. We sharpen both ends of the pencil so that as much of what we have can get to kids and families as possible. These yeah. are communities that have nothing, you know, so yeah. um, we Amazing. we have a culture of no waste. Um, no. These kids go to empty fridges in the morning, <laughs> you know, mm. for breakfast. And so, you know, we've handed out our morning tea bananas to loads of kids and stuff. Mm. And, you know, during oh. COVID, we were ferrying endless supplies of sanitizer and hand wash and tissues out to communities at no cost because we had it here and they needed it. People were saying, wash your hands, stay safe. They had nothing to wash your hands with. Yeah, <laughs> you know, you know, oh. supermarket stores, shelves were bare. And yeah, stuff. yeah. You know, there was there was high health literacy, but there were no products. So, no. so you know, there's, there's, there's myriad ways that people can, mm. can help and be involved if they want to, and just, even just signing up for our newsletter and yeah. across what we do, you know. Absolutely. Paul, well, thank you so much for being on the Impact One Million Project today. Uh, this podcast is very much about sharing people like yourself that are creating impact and uh, doing something that is, you know, has created a legacy. So really appreciate your time being on the show today. Thank you. Lovely to have the chance to talk to you and meet you, Shah. Thank you very much for your time too.